Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Laura. If you're new here, I'd love you to hit subscribe and follow along with my journey. As you can tell from the title, today is going to be a sit down video. Uh, we're going to have a bit of a chat. It's going to be an update in terms of what's been going on at the moment. And then we're also going to answer some questions towards the end uh, that are mainly from TikTok. Um, and then I also just want to chat a little bit about cancer and mental health because that is basically a lot of what the questions have been. So let's get into it. First of all, I want to say it is two days before my surgery and I just got a call from the doctor giving me my surgery time, not from the doctor, the doctor's assistant, or the surgeon's assistant, can't speak today. Um, but basically I was really hoping for as early in the day as possible and that's what they had said too because they really wanted to minimize the risk of you know having it to be cancelled again so my surgery time is going to be noon which means i've got a 10 a.m arrival time so that's a couple of hours earlier than what it was supposed to be last time it was supposed to be 2 p.m but they didn't tell me it was cancelled until closer to 5 p.m so it was pretty pretty hectic but basically the update with that is that this last few weeks have been incredibly challenging challenging for me mental health wise i have really struggled like finally pulling into that finish line with it only being a couple of sleeps away i am in that mindset where i'm you know feeling a lot more positive but for the most part i've really struggled to vlog kind of everything because i i've just been having a lot of down days it's it's really hard when you have such a poor quality of sleep to be rational about things and it's just consistently poor quality of sleep and I feel that leading up from my last surgery to my time in New Zealand, I was only back at work for a few weeks and I definitely had that eyes on the prize in terms of knowing that I was taking a month off. Ty and I were gonna get married, we were gonna spend heaps of time with family and friends and it was just a lot easier that even with that you know, small amount of sleep, I was feeling so much more positive. I went into summer months, even though it rained a lot while I was there, I just felt a lot better about it overall. Coming back, was definitely the most challenging, especially while I waited for that first surgery date. I, I genuinely probably get maximum sort of four hours of sleep a night because what happens is I don't really get a lot of sleep until after all of my food or everything's processed out of the body. So multiple trips to the bathroom to empty my bag. I've got really high output. And then what happens after that is I get nerve pain, which if you haven't been following along in the vlogs, I've been getting nerve pain, which has developed from my neuropathy. Um, and this is what my surgeon has said. Um, and also just from talking to like other stoma nurses, your stoma is not supposed to have any nerve endings. You're not supposed to feel anything. But when my stoma, and I, stoma nurse and I touch the stoma, it now kind of like responds and recoils. And it means that just like everything is just uncomfortable, painful. And in the daytime, I feel like I'm able to really process through that and I'm able to just kind of go on about my day. But at nighttime, I can't switch it off, you know, and it's hard to sleep with that discomfort and that pain. So that poor quality of sleep with working and getting up 4.30 to coach and then being really present for clients has been a huge challenge for me because I felt like I've not been able to show up and really be myself and do my best. And then that in turn makes me feel like rubbish. So I've really ch been challenged in that season to be positive, upbeat Laura. Um, and don't get me wrong, I will find joy in every day. I will always find joy in the small things. And so of course I still have that and I don't feel down all the time, but it's definitely been super challenging. So I was working towards that date of the 6th of Feb and to have that just like the rug pulled out from underneath me was just so tough because if I'd always known that the date was the 24th of Feb and I'd always known that's my surgery date, then I feel like I would have always been working towards that day. And it doesn't mean that it wouldn't have been hard and, you know, I wouldn't have had poor quality of sleep or pain, but I just would have always known that was the day. But working up to the 6th of Feb, like, I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, you did it, Laura. You did it. You made it to this final surgery. You know, this was something that I knew I was going to have when I was having the initial conversations about my first surgery. And I even gave myself like a self five. It sounds so corny, like a high five in the mirror. And so honestly, like the mental preparation, if you've like gone into a major surgery before, you know what goes into preparing yourself for that. So to have that just 
it was it was heartbreaking so the past few weeks have been really tough and kind of only since this weekend that's just gone did I start to feel like wow we're almost there and start to get again into that positive mindset and now I'm feeling really good about it um, I had a really bad night's sleep it was supremely awful but I didn't have to wake up early for anything because obviously I was supposed to be off work so I spent the last couple of weeks kind of doing sporadic pockets of work little bits for clients for that I kind of said that I would do it in a few weeks when I came back to work I've now done now done a little bit of in-person coaching but obviously had got a whole bunch of coverage for that time because I didn't think that I was going to be able to coach um so yeah and then not to mention I had a j pouch a j pouch support group last week which was super beneficial there were a bunch of people who had their loop ileostomies like me and were waiting for the next phase. And then there were a bunch of people that had had their J-pouch surgery and it was really cool of them to share kind of their journey and share, um, you know, little tips and tricks for when you get the J-pouch connected. And they were in kind of different phases. You know, one had only had theirs for six months, another had theirs for a couple of years, and then one person sort of, I think from like 2017. And so cool to hear them in different stages. And, you know, the guy from 2017 was like, yeah, I have veggies at lunch, veggies at dinner. I don't really think about it as much. I can go for an hour run and not really worry about it. And, you know, forget about this season of my life in terms of like the last few years of like having cancer and chemo and having a stoma. Before then, urgency for the bathroom was huge, like huge. And if you had ulcerative colitis, effectively removing your colon is healing from that disease. And so it's crazy to think that once I fully healed from this J pouch surgery, I'll be in a better position than I was pre-cancer. Everyone in the call, nobody had had cancer. Their reasons were all ulcerative colitis. So for them, I guess they're kind of like, maybe not in the mindset that, they're in a better situation. Yeah, I don't know, but that's definitely how I feel. I know that this next phase is going to be hard with the J-Pouch. I'm going to have to get used to another system. And I don't take away from that. I'm not naive to the fact that that is going to be difficult. But I think one of the big things is that I feel like it will be better than my quality of life pre-cancer, which was a lot of urgency for the bathroom, a lot of pain. So I'm looking forward to that. My hair is bothering me this fringe bits are so short because I tried to cut it myself and you know we all know what happened so the hairdresser fixed it so I'm able to tuck it behind my ears just anyway so that's kind of the update with where I'm at I'm gonna try and vlog as much as I can I do lots of little updates on my TikTok so if you don't follow me on TikTok that is probably where I'm most active because I just feel like I can do short little ramblings there so definitely check that out if you have TikTok and if not all good I, I don't post as much on Instagram very uninspired by Instagram at the moment, but um, obviously love my YouTube family and you guys are the most supportive. And honestly, your comments just, they definitely don't go unnoticed. I'm so grateful for all of you. I i do have some questions and um, I'm gonna try and answer them the best I can. The first one that I'm gonna answer is pretty heavy. Um, do you fear the cancer coming back? And the answer to this one is pretty simple for me right now, and the answer is no. I actually don't fear that. I, I think one thing that's helped me, and this will be also connected to another point, is I go back to the data points. So for me, I had colon cancer, and it was just in the colon. They A, removed my colon, and then they did six months, 12 rounds of chemotherapy, and that mopped up all the micro disease. Now the chemo reduces the risk of reoccurrence of disease by 50 percent but mine was in the colon and like i said i mopped up and so i'm like i don't have the colon i've had the chemo my chances are super low now that's how i feel right now and i don't think about it but i definitely my first ct scan and i would even say it was reduced in my second ct scan but my first ct scan following the chemo I was very nervous. I was very scared. I was just thinking the last time I'd had one of these, the results weren't great and it was really terrifying. And so I was taken back to that traumatic moment. And sometimes I think that the therapy for getting over really traumatic moments is repeating it and getting different results or better results. So, you know, if you're afraid of swimming because you had a bad experience, the more you swim and don't have bad experiences, you're gonna feel better. So I now have two CT scans under my belt that have come back clear and that feeling now means that like it's not just attached to 
having an awful experience. So I don't fear it. Um, but you know, like it doesn't mean that I don't get nervous before a CT scan. It's just that I can't live in that headspace. It's totally reasonable to feel that way, especially after having a bad result, but I can't live in that headspace. So I would, yeah, my simple answer is no, but I think if you'd have asked me, you know, six to eight months ago, it would have been a very different answer. Um, how did you cope through the initial cancer diagnosis period? I'm so scared all the time. Um, I feel like I could do a whole video on this because that initial diagnosis period is, is terrifying. It is absolutely terrifying. You know, you hear the word cancer tossed around and it's just, it, it's a scary word. The, the fact of the matter is, is there's a whole spectrum of different types of cancer, different stages. You can have something that can be surgery is all that's needed all the way through to obviously you hear end of life when it comes to cancer and you don't know where you sit or you fall on that, especially in the initial diagnosis period. And it's just such a serious, scary word. And I think the biggest thing I would say from the get go is that take everybody else out of the equation who has gone through cancer, regardless of what stage, and don't listen to people who share their anecdotes or their journeys. Like, just try to block them out. This is your journey, you're on your own path. I, when I first found out, I didn't do any Googling, any researching, any connecting with people at the beginning stages. And the reason was because I didn't know what stage I had. So I wasn't going to go into this headspace where somebody had a certain stage and I kind of compared myself to them because we're different. We might have the same type of cancer, but we're different. So that was really important. So no Googling, no uh, like expanding the net to figure more things out. Just wait until you have all of the data because the data points are important. And when I get really anxious and feel really out of control, especially while I had to wait for my first CT because the way my diagnosis worked is that I had my... It was found by colonoscopy, sent off for biopsy. The biopsy came back, confirmed it was cancer. And then I had to wait three weeks to get a CT scan to confirm whether or not it was localized to the colon. And they kind of, I'm not like like crapping on them, but they kind of fear mongered me a little bit. And they said that it wasn't behaving like normal colon cancer. And they thought it was coming from somewhere else in the body. So they kind of gave me the impression that I was dealing with a bigger situation than I had. So that really spun my mind out. Um, so I had to just keep going back to that. I had a CT scan back in March and nothing was there in March. So if something is there that's outside of the colon, it's only grown since March. So that's the position I'm in. My blood panel came back with really low inflammation markers. So if I had tumors all throughout my body, effectively that would be higher. And that might sound like obsessive, but honestly, you can't stop your mind from reeling. So you have to have a way to soothe it. And I would tell my family all my data points and I had um, Taylor kind of, she was staying at the time before that CT scan. She stayed with me for that week and we'd just be out walking. I'd be like data points and she would reel them back to me and it would, it would help soothe me. The other thing I would say in the initial diagnosis period is that I was prescribed anti-anxiety medication and it did really help. And the best way to explain it, because I've never been on an antidepressant or anti-anxiety, is that you've got the gut-brain axis. So that's like a two-way messaging system and it's the only system in the body that has that two-way messaging system. Everything else is brain down, right? Um, but there's a two-way messaging system. So typically when you feel nervous or you feel anxious, you have that urgency for the bathroom, you have those, you know, butterflies somersaulting in your stomach and yeah, it just feels really chaotic. And the best way to explain that was that my brain would be thinking something, but my body wouldn't be responding in the same way it did. It would feel a lot calmer. And so I did find that quite beneficial because I didn't have that fight or flight response that, um, you know, makes like really heightens the adrenaline. So anti-anxiety medication might be something you want to talk to your doctor about, especially in that initial period. Um, if it needs to be ongoing, that's something that you can discuss, but I only needed mine until... I found out my CT scan results. So I, I was on it for about three weeks and I did see a lot of benefits from that. The next thing I would say is having something to hyper-focus on. So I talked about this in a TikTok, but I would like to watch a TV show and also do a task. So I got really into paint by numbers because it was super detailed and I could just hyper-focus on it 
reading was a little bit more challenging because reading is one of those things where like you'd read a same sentence over and over again and I could get distracted having two things going on at once or like going for a walk with a friend and talking um doing two things at once was really helping to distract my mind I found a lot of benefits from meditation I had a routine in the morning where I would wake up and before I'd have a coffee and I'd definitely drink decaf coffee but I love coffee so that was something that was therapeutic to me as well like that morning ritual is that I would get up I would do a meditation and I would use the superhuman app which I love but the bloom app is also amazing as well but superhuman have these amazing ones that are kind of like it's a sit down one or it's a legs up the wall one or it's a cooking meditation like that was incredible and I use them every day so I just sort of sat down did a meditation that's how I'd start my day so I didn't start my day on a chaotic note and then I would make a coffee I would sit down and I would maybe do some form of movement so either go out for a walk or do some pilates um i definitely couldn't cut going to the gym i just get super distracted and you know it just it didn't work for me so all of those little things having kind of a ritual and a morning routine really helped i found that the mornings are the hardest i'd sort of wake up and be like a bit chaotic so yeah that that's what helped me the most in that time and just i think also setting boundaries around trigger words and things that might you know are going to upset you so for example I didn't like people bringing up like chemotherapy like what I need chemo I didn't like people asking me questions that I didn't know the answer to so what I decided was that I said I am going like if I bring it up I want to talk about it but if I don't let's not talk about it and so that's kind of what my family and friends knew that if I'm talking about it we're talking about it. And so if someone was coming over, they'd be like, they'd wait for me to kind of take the lead on the conversation and if there was something to update them on. And that kind of went for the first part of it. And then once I got really comfortable, it was like, I didn't mind people asking me questions and I got really used to it. But yeah, you really have to protect and set your boundaries because people will just, they think they're doing the right thing and they'll bring up their experience with cancer, but sometimes it's just not helpful. My landlord, bless her, she was in my old place. She had lost her mum the year before to colon cancer. And so every time she would talk about her mum dying and she would like cry to me and she is obviously going through it and she is grieving and she needs to process that. And I'm definitely empathetic towards that, but I'm not the person she should be processing that with. You know, I'm going through this right now and her headspace makes me feel awful. Um, and fearful so you know you have to protect and set those boundaries and that was something I was very big on I also would say find if there's any trigger words for me a big trigger word was the word fight when people would say you will fight this now look I don't want to be naive to the fact that some people and this is like I, I don't want this to trigger someone watching this but some people they they lose to if you want to call it the battle of cancer and that's awful. And so when you hear the word fight, it implies that there's a win or a lose. And I get that that is what it is, but it was a triggering word for me. And I was just like, of course I'm gonna win. Of course I'm gonna beat this. So I didn't like the word fight. When people would say, you'll fight this, you'll beat this. I, I just like, you could use the same concept, like you'll smash this or you'll crush this. And it didn't seem to trigger me, but the word fight really did. So. Find your trigger words and just set really firm boundaries and protect yourself, protect your energy, hang around with the people that make you feel good in that time, talk through it. I saw a therapist like once a fortnight and that was really helpful. I often felt like I didn't have much to talk about, but I definitely did once I sat down. I could just kind of reel it all out and that was extremely helpful for me. Um, the next one was how do you stay so positive? So kind of like it, it is a bit of a video about like cancer and mental health. But I would say, how do I stay so positive? I do think I am a positive person. But I also think part of it is that I allow myself to feel what I need to feel. And sometimes that can be extreme emotion. So if it comes up that I just feel like I want to cry and I want a bit of an outburst, I will do that. I will have that. I think it's healthy to do that. And I will just like let it out. And it's so cathartic and then I'll do something like have a hot shower and like wash like you know 
metaphorically kind of wash that moment off and it allows me to kind of process and move through it or I might go for a walk rather than just like if I let a feeling come up and then I squash it down I that will get me into a negative mind space mind space I will like switch off I was gonna say mindset I will switch off so I need to feel what I need to feel I often need to just talk it out I need a word vomit and when I do it allows me to like just move forward a little bit I also like to find the small thing like okay this is kind of going to be a little bit harsh but like if I'm in a negative mindset if you like I said feel what you need to feel and if that's how you feel like feel it but like if I stay in that negative mindset the person that suffers the most is me I suffer the most when I'm feeling super negative because I I don't enjoy things I feel awful and if I allow myself to feel feelings when they come up, then I allow myself to move through them. And then I'm in a place where I can just, it's really hard to explain, but like find the joy in the small things. Like I love, I love having a hot drink and some biscuits and watching a TV show that makes me feel happy. And I look forward to it. And I kind of set it up to be, especially when I was going through the initial period of my cancer journey, I set that up to be, you know, like an enjoyable task or going out for a walk and going to get a matcha or a juice. And I, I just take myself out of the negative space or out of the situation. And I find that really helps, but I don't want to say that these tips, if you are dealing with actual depression, will just beat that depression. Like I'm not saying that it would be great to talk to someone and see if anti-anxiety or depression meds are, are right for you. But I didn't feel that that was what I needed. I, I wasn't in that space. If that was something I needed, I definitely would have talked about it with my doctor. But I feel that these little things that I do make me feel good. And I always just go back to that list, like what makes me feel good? And sometimes they might be like a very bougie skincare uh, regime. And other times, if I'm honest, that might be no skincare regime at all. Because all I just want to do is veg on the couch. You know, it's not the same all the time. Um, it's definitely going to change. And sometimes just little things like when Ty's like, do you want to order dinner in then? Let's order dinner in. I'll be like, yeah, let's do that. And sometimes that might be like, no, I just want to get outside of the house. So, you know, like you play around with the things that might soothe you and learning how to self-soothe is is super beneficial and I think that's going to be really different for everyone but that's definitely one of the biggest things for me in terms of how I stay positive I feel like I've only answered three questions but I've been talking for so long my intention behind this video is that if you have found this video and you are going through it right now whether you yourself are going through a cancer diagnosis cancer treatment or surgeries or you're supporting someone just know that you're absolutely not alone and that I don't care what people are saying to you, like you are going to just like push through this and you are going to be free of this and I am sending you so much love and I am here in my comment section, in my DMs on Instagram and hopefully my content can bring you some kind of peace. I loved watching people who are further along in their journey. It gave me so much hope and made me feel so positive and I truly think that hope is just so key in a cancer journey. It's just like feeling positive about the future, feeling connected to the future and taking the power out of the word cancer. Like you are powerful. Cancer is not powerful. You are powerful. Look at me doing this little motivational speech. And I think it's scary when you talk to the doctors because they're very matter of fact and they take a lot of the emotion out of it. And that's not to say every doctor or every surgeon, but that's their job is to just relay what, like what's on their chart, what's on the sheet. And they can't get attached to each individual. And I get that, but just know that that is that and just park that. And I don't know, I don't know where I'm going with that, but I just want to say, I know that can be really triggering when you talk to doctors and it just feels like there's not a lot of um, compassion behind the words. There is, they care. And it's just that they have to do their job and just be very matter of fact. But I love you all. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for continuing to support me and to support this channel. Um, I love making videos for you guys. Even when I go absent for a little while, it's it's because I'm exhausted. But whenever I post, you guys just 
you recharge me, you refuel me, your comments are just so loving. And so thank you so much. And I hope that you enjoyed this video and my next vlog will probably be my surgery vlog. So stay tuned, subscribe, give this video a like if you enjoyed it and I'll see you in my next.